Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Robins Report podcast with me, your host, Tom Wade. And as you can see, it's a very special episode again because we are joined by, in my opinion, Chatham Town uh, royalty. Um, but of course, that's not JP. But JP <laughs> is here with us <laughs> alongside me. We're coming apart of the furniture now. JP, how are you doing, mate? How's your, how's your week been? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Yeah, all good. As we were saying before we came on, I think the weather's been a bit better where you are in Ireland, but it's been uh, been a bit chilly here, but all, all good. Looking forward to the last game of the season on Saturday. And yeah, uh, great to see Steve again uh, yeah. after, a year after we last chatted. <laughs> it is great. It's great to see Steve. And yeah, I'm looking forward to Saturday. Uh, I mean, we'll touch on a bit bit that later on. Um, I'm glad in a way, obviously it was done for the right reason. I'm glad Twitter was down because, uh, yeah, my meltdown mode on Saturday was not impressive. <laughs> but there you go. It's what happens. It's, it's part of the part of the process, but we we'll trust it. But before we do speak to Steve, of course, got to give a shout out to our brilliant sponsors, Luke1977. As you know, go to Luke1977.com, shop their spring and summer collection. I haven't got the T-shirt on this week uh, just because I feel... It's important to wear the shirt as much as I can at the moment, especially over here in Ireland. And you do get some funny looks and it makes it a lot more funnier. But anyway, let's get into it. So the man that's joining us today, 92 appearances, 13 league goals in four years. As I mentioned, in my opinion, he's in the folklore of Cheltenham Town, especially during a period where I was growing up watching the team. That, uh, that era was just incredible for me. And me and JP, we were actually speaking about it yesterday and saying how there's just something different about that that part of uh, the history of this club. But yeah, Steve Guinan, thanks for joining us. How are you doing? I'm all right. I, I'm just more more happy than anything. You got my surname pronounced right. I'm delighted. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I'm fine, thanks. All, all good. Good, good. I will admit, when you first joined, it was like, Gwynnon, Gwynnon. Oh, it's Guinan. Then you hear, hear, the, hear the, uh, the PA do it. It's like, oh, there you go. Then there it is. You can imagine trying to book a pub or a restaurant and phone up. Hey, how do you spell that surname? And it's like, I'll, I'll just take anything, to be honest. I don't even correct them anymore. It doesn't bother me. I don't think you need any help, Steve, does it? Because Gins might yeah. make everyone think it's Gwynnon, but obviously you don't, you don't really get called Gines, do you? No, not really. Gins, Gines sometimes, but I think the Guinness kills it because the way you pronounce Guinness, people say, <laughs> oh, and I'm like, it's just not, but yeah, I... I Got used to it down the years from a million different permutations of the way it's pronounced. So I don't have many fighters. <laughs> there is bigger things to worry about, I guess. So, yeah. You know, yeah, I know. But yeah, you've been keeping well. How's the family and stuff? Hope you're all good during this time. Yeah, we're all good. All good. Um, yeah, you know, touch wood. More importantly, families healthy and well. Extended health, you know, extended families healthy and well. Um, been, been awkward for for everyone, I think, you know, across the nation and across the rest of the world. But um, I'm still stuck in this room, as you can see. Probably John, 12 months ago, I was still in this room. Uh, started to get out a little bit over the last four, five, six weeks, which has been nice. Um, but yeah, we're all good. You know, worse things are happening, aren't they? So I count myself lucky. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I mean, we all know why we're here. We want to talk about your 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 career, not only Cheltenham, but. Uh, before and after as well. But before we do, I think it's important. What, what, what's the uh, what's the Steve Guinan daily routine at the moment then? <sighs> uh, I think if you ask the wife, she'd probably say, I don't do enough around the house in terms of my daily routine. Um, I don't know. Yeah, we've been, you know, we, the FA, have been slowly let off the leash a little bit since, since lockdown has started to ease. So, we we sort of allowed back out into clubs three times a week, uh, and we have to have a day in between because of COVID restrictions. So, if we're out a full week, that's either Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, and then taking a game on Saturday. So, uh, the last couple of weeks, well, yeah, I've definitely tried to maximise my visits into clubs. Um, and when I'm not in a club, uh, I have today. I've just been like everyone else, uh, Zoom and Microsoft teamed out, just staring at a laptop for seven eight nine hours a day on various meetings and planning planning events and uh courses cpd everything else but uh the benefit is in my role i talk football that's all i do you know i get paid to talk football which you know I, again i count myself lucky at that really yeah definitely i, I think wow the dream is for me is to be paid to talk football and i'd love that and i can talk football all day long as as <laughs> listen every viewer and listener I tell you they 
sometimes I go on and on and on because I just, you know, I've got nothing. I just live and breathe it, and it's it must be brilliant to be in that position. And of course, working working for the FA and being a big part of uh, you know shaping the future of the of the con- you know country in international football, I suppose. Yeah, I'd like to say that, but I can't take any credit for that. But um, yeah, I mean, it's 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 an interesting job. So probably my official title is quite a mouthful. It's senior professional game player to coach lead. But trying to make that in simple terms, I I develop coaches who want to become coaches, uh, particularly in the professional game. So any any senior player um, that transitions and wants to become a coach or a manager from particularly the top end, so UEFA A pro license. I I oversee the whole strategy from, you know, 16, 17 year olds from a level two UEFA C through a pro license. And I also run a run a bespoke program helping our former England internationals and current England internationals. So rightly or wrongly, you know, I think ninety five percent of the current coaches and managers in the ninety two clubs are former players. And I think that will always be the case as much as there's a there's a there's an area in the game for non-players, and I look at you know Klopp, who who was a former player but didn't play at the top end, Mourinho, people like that. There's definitely space in the game for those, but particularly in our country, the majority of our coaches and managers are former players, and we recognise that. And the amount of detail and research that's shown that for those profile names that get a first-time job, well, how can we help them be a success? And I think. Again, some of the research we've done, and I'll throw this out to you, you, you probably know this. When was the last time an English manager won a top domestic trophy? Go on, John, you may know this. Well, Howard Wilkinson was the last one to win the league, wasn't he? I think, 92. Yeah. Um, Cup-wise, was it Brian Little or something in Villa? Or was it more no. recent than that? More um, recent? Recently? Um well, it's not recent, but it's more recent than that. Yeah, more recent. Oh, than that. who was in charge of St- uh, Wigan when they won the FA Cup? It's not them, Martin. No, no. Uh, where's Martin? Is it the League Cup, Steve? Is it the League Cup? FA Cup. FA Cup. FA Cup. It's a pub question, isn't it? It's a pub quiz question. A great yeah. question. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, yeah. It just says oh, a lot that I've got a clue who it is. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll put you out of your misery. It was Harry Redknapp at Portsmouth. Ah, oh, uh, of course. Yeah. And that's, that's over that was a decade ago, isn't it? 2008 yeah yeah so you look at that 13 years ago and we're trying to remedy that we're trying to help increase the quality and quantity of english qualified coaches so we're trying to address that not just domestically but obviously you know the good work that gareth did at the world cup in russia well you know can he try and replicate that again this summer but but perhaps more importantly for us is who's underneath that who's the succession plan who's the yeah. next person who's bubbling away and i think you know, in the last 12 or 18 months, you've obviously got Stephen Gerrard, who's won a title in Rangers, Frank Lampard, unfortunately, out of a role. Um, and you've got a load of other former high-profile names who, who who I and we, the FA, are trying to help be a success. I think that's what we're trying to do, really. Michael Duff, of course, in there with those two as well. <laughs> well, he's done, done brilliant. You know, I think, uh, is he English or Irish-born? I don't know. He's He's born in Belfast, so he's obviously he played for Northern Ireland, but he's yeah, yeah. he spent all of his he spent most of his life in England. But he yeah, yeah he's got one Northern Irish parent and one Republic of Ireland parent. So, so, so what does what does Michael say? Does he say he's English or Irish? Because of his Northern Ireland football links, I think he's but you know his English he's he's got, to it, accent, he? he's got an English accent. He he was spent a lot of his youth in North Yorkshire and then Oxfordshire, but he was born in Belfast. I think they lived in Germany the family for a while as well. So yeah, changed as well. Yeah. 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 But Shane was born in in Wiltshire, I think. But yeah, the, you know, he could have played for any of the countries. I think any of the you know Republic, Northern, or or England. Yeah, yeah. So you know, he, he has done brilliant. And funnily, Michael, he actually go back into lockdown version one, version two, when everyone was scrambling around to do podcasts and zooms. I, I arranged a call with um, Gareth Southgate and a number of coaches and managers. And Michael came on the call, and I had a bit of a giggle with him because he was. It was a bit of a question and answer at the end, and Michael was the first one to ask a question. And I texted him after and said, "Oh, you got him first. And he went, "Yeah, I didn't know what to do." But um, <laughs> what did yeah, he ask? Can we say? Oh, I can't remember. No, I can't no, remember. No. Twelve months ago now, almost. But uh, yeah, it's done brilliant. You know, got ever so close last year. And I think the the most impressive thing for me is actually gone one better. I think sometimes the disappointment lingers a little bit, and it's a bit of a slow start. But from where, how close they got facing those disappointments and, and 
hopefully winning the title on at the weekend. Fair play to him, he deserves a pat on the back. And do the yeah. rest of the Yeah, definitely. Well, that's what I was going to ask you, actually. What have you made of uh, this season and obviously last season as well, but mainly this season, what have you made of how how Charlton play now under Michael Duff and obviously the job that he's doing? Well, first and foremost, promotion is the main aim, isn't it? And, and, and the club's achieved that. Um, I think he's... He, He's stated he wants to win the league, and if I was in his shoes, I'd do exactly the same. And they're in pole position, aren't they? If they win the game, that's it. It's theirs. Um, I, I think, I think he's made a shrewd signing in Wade Elliott. If I'm honest, yeah. Uh, I know Wade from my time with the FA, and I did the pro license with Wade a couple of years ago. Uh, I think he's came in and added an extra dimension. Uh, and I also think, particularly, you know, one or two of the players that he's brought in have. have, have I've added a little bit more to the squad and I think more the more I talk to coaches and managers in the game, I think it, a lot of it boils down to recruitment. And I think the two do go hand in hand. And funny enough, I spoke to someone driving back today from a club and we spoke about how, how well Lee Bowie has done at Birmingham and mm. pretty much the same group of players, but he's gone in, changed the results, they've got away from the relegation zone and the manager can have, have an impact. But you look at you know a lot of the best managers and coaches they rely on the best players, and I, and I, you know, I'm not saying Michael's got the best players, but I think what the skills and the toolkit that he's got to get the best out of the players, but with some shrewd additions across the summer, they've been brilliant. Uh, I think they really have, and I, you know, I, I think you have to look at the loan signings that brought in as well, and I think there's been one or two clever ones in that mix. So, um, yeah, fair play to him and, and and the wider club in general, really. Yeah, definitely. It's 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 all come together, really. We wow, well, we we've mentioned so many times before, me and JP, about how he's changed what he had when he came in to what he's got now, and it's it's only going to go on as we go up next year. It's only going to get better, and it's just you got to admire the job he's done. He's just been so fantastic, and you like you said, you know, another ex player, so it adds that little bit of something extra, and I think that's that's kind of what means most about this season as well in terms of where. I said today on Twitter where I rank it is, is it the biggest game of the club's uh, history on Saturday? I, I argued, well, it probably is in, in the sense of they're going to do something they've never done before. No team before this has ever done what, what, what this team's going to achieve or, and still could achieve. And I think as a whole, the way Michael came in and now he's to what he's got now, I think it's just incredible. It's been incredible to watch. And JP, you know, you've been, you've been, able to watch it unfold in front of your eyes I'm sure I, you feel exactly the same Yeah, I, d I don't class it as the biggest game in the club's history because even though they're trying to do something they've never done before which division they're going to be in isn't dependent mm. on this game like when Steve played in the um, the final it was a mm. one-off game, you had to get it right or you were staying down in League 2 get it right and you're going up to League 1 it would be nice to win the league but I think the big thing, as Steve said, the aim was promotion I think it, it is big and it will be a bit of a disappointment which sounds weird, but it'd be a bit of a disappointment if they finish second. But I think getting top three after what happened in the playoffs last year um, would be, you know, brilliant achievement anyway. But one of the things I'd be interested to ask Steve is obviously you played with Shane at Cheltenham, didn't you? All, all the time you were at Cheltenham, Shane was there. And I don't know how well you've you've got to know Michael, but do you see do you see some similarities? Can you tell their brothers because Shane was quite driven and he was always very a bit like you was active outside of football, putting plans together for his, for his future, wasn't he? Like you were doing your degree. I think Shane went on did a degree and was always planning and obviously he's gone into property now. But do you see similarities between the two of them and even though they've gone in different directions now? Yeah, I have I've played golf a few times with Shane over the last twelve months. Um and I think in the early days when, when Shane dropped out of, of, of football and he, he you know for a short period of time he had a spell at Hartby College, didn't he? And he was lecturing and I spoke to him a bit during that period and you know, you look at him now and how well he's done with his property management and his portfolio, and he's driven through a different angle. But when we play golf, you know, as much as people want to talk and you know ask questions and and voice their opinions, it always comes back to football. And I think Shane's a football person at heart, and it's difficult sometimes because yeah, I think we played golf a handful of times, but you don't want to ask too much because I'd be I'd be quite keen to ask Shane and. You know, have a couple of pints after school and tell me about Michael. What's he going through? What's how does he manage his daily routine? And but it's private and confidential, so I don't really want to ask those questions. If Shane wants to tell me that, that's fine. But 
you look at the way Michael Michael's career has gone, and and I think you know with some of the work we're doing at the FA, the research tells you it actually it's better to take a longer period of time and and gain we call them you know earn your stripes behind the scenes away from the spotlight and I think Michael's done that you know with his time at Burnley with the 23s and getting some experience of making mistakes on the grass has probably a afforded in this opportunity with obviously being a former player playing in the Premier League links to the area and his wife etc but I I do think going back to your point Tom I, I think it's it makes a huge difference that his family are still based in the area he's a former player for a number of years because there are a number of people out there that are mercenaries and I'm going to go to a club that got no affinity affinity to the to the geography, mm. to the location of the club. Michael obviously had with his family to get a connections, former player. And he you know, he wants the whole thing to be a success. And I don't know Michael particularly well, but even though he's got promotion and hopefully champions, I don't think that'll stop. You know, yeah. I, I he would definitely want to go better and be, you know, a survival of League One. I mean I well, what is success for Cheltenham next season? I would humbly say, in my opinion, staying up. Yeah. But, and I think Michael would, but I don't think he's that naive to think, well, that's success now. I want to get me table and I want to get, you know, on the coattails of the playoff places. And, mm-hmm. and that will be what you said then. That will be the best, the highest Cheltenham we've ever finished, won't it, if that's the case? Yeah. Um, so I've no doubt that I've got plans behind the scenes with Mickey Moore recruitment. But, you know, they're probably talking to players already of targets if they've not already tied one or two up. Um, it'll be really interesting to see how, how they how they perform and how they fare next year. But I can definitely see two self-driven people um, focused and not wanting to just settle back and relax and take it for what it is. They always want to keep pushing the envelope. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's a great point. To be fair, I think that's absolutely spot on. Um, just moving on a little bit from there. Obviously, guys, we got you on. I want to talk a little bit about your career now, if we can. Um, how long have you got? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how long is my dinner going to be love oh she's not here I've got to do it myself so I can do it as long as I can <laughs> um, but yeah basically you I looked at your career earlier today and it is it is one that I look at and I think wow that is some number of clubs different reasons why you are where you are where you ended up where you didn't go etc etc but the interesting one for me was the start obviously you joined uh, Nottingham Forest didn't you as a trainee um, and you signed your first pro deal in 93. What was that like and what work went into getting to that point? Um, probably, in all honesty, no, no different to any other kid in the country in terms of I, I was playing. I mean, I know that the, the rules are slightly changed nowadays in that, you know, club signings and schoolboy players as they were affectionately you known don't don't play for grassroots teams, do they? But but I did. That was the, That was my... That was my route into football, played uh, local clubs. That's how I started at three years old. My brother was six. I played up a few years because I was physically able to. Um, schools, districts, counties, grassroots teams. And then at about 12 or 13, I started to you know, get some of the attention of some of the scouts. And um, I didn't actually sign for anyone at all until I was until I was about 15. And the way it was then, you had to sign schoolboy from... I think it was 12 to 14, then 14 to 16. And I didn't because I wanted to see what was what was good and what was bad. And I wanted to every half term or full term holiday, I, I would go all over the country on, on effectively trials and clubs yeah. would you know, try and bribe you affectionately. I don't mean in terms of finances, but in a pair of boots is, you know, come and sign for us and yeah. blah, blah, blah. And I, yeah, I can remember going all over the place. Uh, Villa, I'm a Villa fan at heart. Villa was a total letdown. I, I couldn't stand it. It was back then when Joseph Englos, the Czechoslovakia manager, was in charge. And they made us train on a concrete car park. I didn't like the coach. I, I just didn't get a good vibe for the players. Went up to Man United. Brilliant. Loved it. Alex Ferguson wrote my mum and dad a letter. That, but and I was going to sign, but I didn't because I thought I'm never going to get in. You know, it's Man United. I got no chance. And I went up to Forest and it was... They just made you feel part of the family in all honesty. It was, you know, you went up for a couple of nights and you know, John Finnegan and Craig Armstrong were there at the same time and just got a good vibe and good dynamics of the players. Nottingham was only an hour and a half from Birmingham, so I knew it wasn't miles and miles away. And just made a decision that was the place I was gonna go. Probably with another another couple of factors. Brian Clough was a manager. Forrest had a really good reputation of bringing through young players at that at that time. So it just seemed to all fall into place. Um, 
probably we didn't know what full-time football was like the first two years was an absolute eye-opener in terms of what you saw behind the scenes <laughs> um but we had a good youth team got, i think we got to the semi-finals of the youth cup and lost to Millwall. um but i ended up obviously impressing to a certain degree and getting a pro contract so at, at that point you know you think christ that's it i'm a footballer you know all my dreams have come true but knowing you know in hindsight that's not even the first hurdle you got years to go yet yeah that's it and it's, it's it's all about getting you got you get there and it's all about what you do from there i suppose to up your game to make sure you're on that it's almost like you're on that platform you've got to stay on that platform and i think is it harder to get on there or is it harder to stay on do you think harder to stay on yeah it's, it's, it's really difficult to get there but and I say this now, and I still say it to some of the to the younger players. It's there's always someone younger, fitter, and who who will do it for less money than you. And the sooner as you relax uh, and sit back on your laurels and think that's it, you you'll be left out. You'll be embarrassed. It'll, it'll hit you in the eyes before you know it. And, and and personally, that's why I admire people like Ronaldo and Messi and the best in the world all right i admire them for the skills but to continue to perform at that top level when there's always someone who your critics are going to knock you up i think it's frightening and the amount of games they've played at that mm. intensity it's 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 frightening but yeah i i just i just think that there's a number of steps you make okay try and become a footballer apprentice professional footballer and you know it does it does wind me up sometimes when some of the younger players now 19 20 and was I doing the same thing? Probably, but they don't work on the extras after training. It's like, oh, I'm a footballer. You know, they want the adulation and the, the benefits of being a footballer, but they don't want to work hard at their trade and continue to hone the skills. And uh, I've seen it today. I've been at a first team today of a championship club. And, you know, right, that's it. You can stay out and do 20, 10 or 20 minutes. You've probably got two or three or four of the senior players doing it. Mm. One or two. And the others are going in. I'm thinking, what are you doing? Yeah. So, you know, you've got an opportunity to get paid in the sunshine to go and practice for 10 or 20 minutes and it just baffles me it really does but like we all know as you get older with age it's easy with hindsight I sound like an old dad and uncle but what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> obviously you are you are a dad we'll go on a little bit more on fire sand but do you, do you kind of say obviously your son zach plays at cheltenham is that the kind of it like you know you use your experience and transfer across to him and just make sure that, that this is what you need to be doing and you've got to stay doing this and just try and give that same advice as you do to everybody else. Um, I'd like to say yes, but probably less so mm. uh, uh, with him. I, he's not in the house so I can talk and I don't really watch this, but obviously I love him to bits, but he, he's got to find his own path for me. Uh, mm. I, I can remember having a conversation with one of the coaches at the club a few years ago and I, I personally don't care if, he's, if he becomes a footballer or not, it's whatever he wants to do. If he wants to go into property, he wants to go and become a teacher, if he wants to go and become a plumber, I, I don't care. But I want him to stay in love with the game, if that makes sense. As a dad, I've always wanted my son to be, to be uh, involved in football in some capacity, even if it's going to watch the game together as a fan. And we, we did that. We went to the to the, the League Cup final last weekend. We went to Wembley Cup. We got tickets through the FA, so we were quite uh, lucky. But I just want to go and have a couple of pints with him. But, you know, 25, 30 years old, go and have a chat about the England game, the Cheltenham game, the Villa game, whatever it is. I just want to talk football with him. But if he wants to play, and if he's a scholar at Cheltenham now, which is, he's obviously got a certain degree of talent, continue to play. Don't just let that waste and die away, whether he becomes a professional at Cheltenham or not, or elsewhere continue to play and fall in love with the game because I'd still like to watch him in five, ten years, whether that's for Cheltenham, Man United or the Red Lion. I don't care. Continue to play because it's a great experience. A new set of friends. You can run off the exertions, the frustrations of the week. you got another focus for the week. It's it's a brilliant sport. So um, I probably just want him to find his own path wherever that will go. Yeah, definitely. Is, is he like you, Steve, do you think? Um, he's a big lad now, isn't he? He's, he's, he's shot up. Um, I saw him playing some of the FA Youth Cup games and he's do you, do you see similarities in the way that he goes about his game to the way you played or do you see him as being a very different type of type of striker? Um, probably more 
more weighted towards a similar approach. Um, he's definitely taller than me. I didn't like to admit it a couple of years ago, but <laughs> a couple of inches on me at least. He keeps saying he's stronger than me, but that'll never happen, John. I can always <laughs> wait him. I throw him on the set. Um, yeah, he's, he's yeah six foot two at least. He, he's still got room to fill out and, and put on some muscle bulk, which I think is important. Um, I was far from the quickest player. In fact, some people still say I was the slowest player I ever played with. I always argue with it. Um, you know, Zach, Zach's not blessed with pace, but I think there's a place in the game for that. I think the type of game that he that he plays in terms of a link and a hold-up play, which was similar to me, he's got a better knack of me. He scores more goals than me. Um, and I think it doesn't matter what type of centre-forward you are. If you can score 15 or 20 goals a season, clubs will want you whatever level clubs will want you. So, uh, yes, that will mean different systems, but particularly with strikers, most clubs carry four or five strikers nowadays. You know, they're the ones who make the changes from the bench. They're the ones who get a number of starts. So, um, he's got a lot of similarities to me, but hopefully he's got one or two that are probably way better than I ever had. So, um, he's just got an opportunity now to refine those over the next 12, 18, 24 months. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, I don't. I haven't, obviously, I haven't been there able to watch much, but what I've seen and what I've heard, the goals-wise, he, he's got a lot of potential there. So I'll be quite interested, as much as probably you are, to see how he goes. But I think you're right in terms of create your own path. I think that's 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 absolutely brilliant because you know you know yourself. You get you get the odd parents that are too too hands-on, in a sense, and it and sometimes you know it it it's, uh, it's probably your pet hate, isn't it? I guess that. Yeah, it's it, it, yeah, it's another thing that winds me up, Tom. The amount of games I go to, and I did some of the um, some of the scouting for England national teams for four or five years, and you'd stand close to some of the parents, and they live their well, their wanted careers that they never had through their through the kids, and the shouting and instruction, berating them, sometimes encourage, just shut up, just let them find a way, and. I, hmm. You know, I, I've got no problem with encouragement in terms of, come on, uh, you can do better, good luck, fine, no problem. But when they start to instruct, and I have to bite my tongue because it's not my place to say anything, and I, I would never say anything. But the only time I've said something, I tell a lie, was at my daughter's game. And it was a she play, she's 14, but this was a couple of years ago. And I was a parent of a grassroots side on a Saturday morning, like seven aside. And they, they, they respect ropes, you know, you can't go any closer to the pitch. And this parent was just literally walking up and down the touchline on the other side of the rope, telling his daughter, kick it, edit, boot it. You've got to drop in. You've got to push over. You've got to squeak. And I was just thinking, uh, well, I was having a coffee, just enjoying it, a bit of sunshine. And it was just grating on me. So in the end, I stepped over the rope and just stood there and I blocked his path. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing more importantly? I said, leave your poor door. I said, if you look and just shut up for a minute, every time she does something, she looks over at you. Why yeah. she do? Well, I don't know. Or perhaps because she's looking over at a reaction. Have you done anything? I said, just leave her alone, the poor girl. And frustrates me, winds me up a tree. It's, uh, but that, that always happens. And it's like the blokes down in the pub that, that I am now when you see the shouting at the TV and they're having a go at it. <laughs> Everyone thinks they know the game, don't they? Me included. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Talk about the game. Obviously, going back a little bit to the Forest one, if your time at Forest, so you made you made four, you made four Premier League appearances. Um, what was it like? Because it was obviously the early days of the Premier League then. It's nothing like you see now. It's proper. For me, I was watching some of back the other day, actually, the early years when you get it on the sky and stuff. And some of the tackles, some of the some of the pitches, some of the goals, some of the way the forwards threw themselves about and that. It must have been an absolute war zone back then compared to what it is now. But what are your early memories of that? And do you actually remember your, when you made your debut and the feeling it was? Yeah, I, funny enough, Zach was watching the same thing, the Premier League years the other week. And yeah. the first ever te televised game was Forest Liverpool. And uh, Craig, John Finnegan, and myself were actually ball boys. So we were first year scholars, apprentices, whatever it was. And the new stand, the Bridgeford stand that was being built behind the goal, uh, the bottom tier we just had the concrete, no seats. So we actually had to stand and space ourselves out. So when the ball went over, uh, we asked to collect it and throw it on the pitch. And the goal that Teddy Sheringham scored when he cut in and bent it in the top corner, you can see me jumping up in the little blue umbro kit behind the goal. And that was that was six weeks into my first year apprenticeship. And even back then, I was thinking it was the first televised Sky game, full house at the city ground. You're playing against Liverpool. 
it was like Jesus. This is just, you know, that was you know the closest I've ever got. And in terms of you know as apprentice, you had to go in the dressing room, pick up the kit, clean the boots, and to see that first hand was yeah, I said that that first few years was just eye opening, really. Um, yeah. yeah. Going back to my debut, Christ, yeah, I'd, I'd had a good a good year really, my first year pro, and being part of the squad for probably five, six, maybe ten games, but never even made the bench. Stayed in the hotels and was part of it. And, Felt comfortable with, with the players. Um, but, yeah, it was just a total bolt out of the blue. I can remember um, being in the hotel. It was at Wimbledon away, of all places. Wimbledon away, God. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, Vinnie Jones in the side, Robbie Earl, um, Dean Holdsworth, people like that. And I can remember coming down in the hotel. We had the team meeting. It was probably sort of midday. No, it was probably later than that. I think it was 1 o'clock. So we used to hotel around the corner, literally... 20 minutes on the bus and Frank Clark was a manager and it was, you know, the old flip chart and turned the flip chart over and played four, three, three. And my, my name was on and I just didn't expect it. Cause I thought, well, if, if I am lucky enough to ever make an appearance, it would be from the bench and it'd build up my confidence. And it was just like, I think we'd gone through a period where we were struggling to score goals. Um, and he dropped Ian Wong. It was now Sean Deitch's assistant at Burnley, changed the shape. And he played me up from with Brian Roy and Jason Lee. Um, just Jason was down the central, Brian was on the left, and I was on the right. And uh, I, yeah, I think Stuart Pierce was captain, and I just one of those things, but I didn't even have a chance to pick up the phone because it was literally straight on the coach. I don't even think I had a mobile phone back then because it was mobile phones were still new, and I couldn't tell my family. And, um, yeah, fascinating. It was just one of those things where pinch moment and try you know try and be as professional as you can do because you've got a job to do but there were still moments in that game and the ball's out of play even it was Selhurst part in the time where you're just looking around going Jesus I'm playing well not even in the Premier League I'm just I'm just I'm making a first team appearance for Forest I just it was just incredible you're looking around at some of the people on the pitch and uh, and the, the one thing and I've told this story a couple of times I did because I had I wasn't quick but I was obviously quicker than what I was at sort of 26 27 but I'm not making Vinnie Jones and got around the other side of him and he chased after me shouting all the expletives in the world just kind of side me down and um, but he did get me back about 10 minutes later but yeah brilliant brilliant you know what a, when all those dreams come together fantastic moment yeah it really is and you mentioned there some players like Stuart P.S. obviously Roy I know Roy Keane and Teddy Sheringham were there during your time there what was it like just being around them and seeing what they you know what they went on to achieve and and just being a part of that, it must have been just a bit mind blowing, especially at that age as well. Yeah, it, it, it's difficult to describe, but it is every kid's dream, you know. Particularly in the, the first year when I, when I was an apprentice, and we had yeah Teddy Sheringham, Roy Keane, Brian Clough was manager, Stuart Pearce, Nigel Clough. You know, we had some unbelievable players, um, and. You know, Brian Clough literally made you do everything in the dressing room. So mm. you had to go and pick up the boots. Two or three of you had to go and just stand in there when he was giving his team talks in case he, he wanted you to do anything. You had to run him a bath. Craig will tell you the story. He had to go for you had to go back to Brian Clough's house and cut the garden and Barbara would make you breakfast. And it was just so weird. You had to run him a bath. And I, I remember I, we got called in, two or three of us had to come. He, he had some guests, I don't even know the way. We had to go to his office after a game, sing happy birthday to some random people. And he, he dished out some 50 quid notes to us as a thank you. And 50 quid was like more than money that, you know, a 50 pound note. I don't think I'd ever seen one. And uh, <laughs> it was just, you know, to be up close and be around it. And um, I, the only downside of that was, was obviously that was Brian Clough's last season. They got relegated. And it was just, it was just so sad to be around the place particularly that last six weeks when you know it's probably commonly known now he, brian had a drinking problem and wasn't in a great space at that time and people ended up leaving the club in terms of teddy and roy Keane. but to see them train day in day out the intensity the work rate what you know looking on as, a, as an apprentice and that's some of the stuff i say now is do you really watch and scrutinize players to see how hard it is to to continue to play at that top level and people think they work hard and they watch players, but they don't really, I don't think. No, yeah. No, I was, I was laughing. <coughs> Excuse me. You answered the question now. I was going to ask you what it's like, you know, being, being, uh, being a trainee. It's not even just a trainee, just at the same club, at the same time as Cluffy there. Because we all, we've all seen the, the films, documentaries, and I'm how he was. 
and you just mentioned how sad it was when it got to that point. But it's still at that point it must have been incredible just to see how he worked as a as a man and not well, not only as a manager but as a man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, obviously a huge and a successful manager in his own right, uh, particularly at, at Derby and Forest, and um, you know the, the affinity he had for the East Midlands clubs, the fans had for him. And to see the respect the players had for him, you know, even back then, I've got hair standing up on my arm now. Where if he spoke in that dressing room, you, you know, Stuart Pearce, the, the the patriot he was, you know what I mean? How passionate! And you got Roy Keane who who would be having a go at everyone. As soon as Brian Clough spoke, the dressing room just fell silent. And the amount of respect, that two way respect, was was phenomenal. And you know, he'd got lots of tricks of the trade. And I think Roy's told the story a number of times now about he. I think it was Barker's young eagle of the month. He won something and he came back in the dress room and I think Roy had a big smile on his face and he went, you know, well done, son, blah, blah. And he just punched him in the ribs. He just gave him a, a little a little dig and he went, there's a game out there now, get outside, you know. And comes, he's just he just had a way and a knack of bringing players back down to earth and um, and even some, some little snippets, you know, I think it's commonly known as well. The amount of times we'd go running about Wollerton Park, the big stately home, and we went there a few times in pre-season, ju- June, July, red up, right, that's enough, red up, everyone get an ice cream, bugger off home, go and spend some time with your wives and your girlfriends, you know, you're going to be away enough in hotels. And we've just got a knack. And you look back then, some of the, some of the things that I can remember one, one occasion I had to go with him. And I, I, I told my wife about this years ago where I was injured and he came in and I remember just sitting in the physio room and he, dragged me up like this and I had to go with him in his car and his dog bellboy he was licking me in the back seat and his 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 other son had run a news agency in West Bridgeford and I had to go in there and choose 20 magazines women's magazines chocolates flowers from the florist next door and by the time the players had got back from training they were all laid down on, on the benches and he just gave them all. I think it was Mother's Day, and he went, it's important you look after your wives and girlfriends. And I look back, and I didn't think anything of it at the time, but you know, some of the little tricks and the the, the, the pearls of wisdom and the, the things he used to do to make the families feel welcome, the players feel good about themselves, it was brilliant. And man management's a crucial part of that game, but who taught him? I have no idea, but he just knew how to, how to maximise what he got from the players. Yeah, yeah, definitely. He was just one of those special, you know, people say Jose Mourinho, for example, the special one. I don't think uh, that's quite right when you look at guys like, you know, like Cleffy. It's just proper old school, just just knew, knew what it was about. It's just, it's incredible. But moving on a little bit from Forrest, um, you, obviously you ended up, you did a few loan spells while you were there. Um, you went, I know you went to Plymouth. Plymouth was one where you played uh, 11 games, scored seven goals. And you played actually. I didn't know this until I did research it earlier. I'm not going to lie. Like, I'm not. I'm not JP. I'm not the encyclopedia of football. But I didn't realise. But you played in the game when Jimmy Glass scored for Carlisle. I did. What was that like? That must have just been one of their moments of just like you got. Obviously, you got that. What you did with Forest and stuff. And you've obviously got that. And it must be like this football world's insane. Yeah, brilliant. I, do you know what? I actually saw Jimmy Glass last week. Yeah. Uh, He's now a coach at Bournemouth, and I went down to Bournemouth for the day. And I hadn't seen he, we sort of looked at each other, and it was one that we got in anyway. And we were talking to the coaching staff, and he went, Do you know Jimmy scored in that? I went, Yeah, I played it. He went, Yeah, that's where I know you're from. And, uh, and believe it or not, Jimmy's got a picture on his phone still of him scoring it. And I'm in, I'm in the box, I wasn't marked, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we had a little giggle. Yeah, I, again, it was yeah, successful loan spell. I loved Plymouth at the time actually was unsure about going because it was just so far away but loved it clicked got on with the players loved the place um and that that game for plymouth it was it was a non-event uh, yeah in fact, it happened i think we played scarborough we were in the football league at the time on a tuesday or wednesday and carlisle away was on the the, the saturday and yeah you stayed up for two or three days because you weren't going to come back to plymouth to go back again and because it was we were safe mid-table we were allowed to have a few beers, even on the, I think we went out in Scarborough on the Wednesday night, definitely had some beers in the hotel on the Friday. And we played the game on the Saturday. And I think we went one up to a lad called Lee Phillips. And we knew the permutations. It was a massive game for Carlisle. They had to win or they were down. It was a full house at Brunton Park, which was quite scary because um, it was quite a 
volatile atmosphere because it was Nigel Pearson who was manager and they, they were obviously going to turn on him if things were going sour and when it went one up it was we were getting launched people chucked up you know on the pitch chucking stuff on the pitch and equalized and, and even then I just thought we're in no danger here it'd be a one all they might go down depending on the results I think um but I just didn't even think about and, and this was a bit how naive we were back then, you know, what if the goalkeeper comes up? Probably really wasn't the done thing and <laughs> he came up. I think I was marking someone else. The goalkeeper came up. No one knew the bloody hell's happening here. It's a bit weird and no one picked him up and when the ball sort of fell to him and he smashed it in, it just chaotic scenes, you know, fans running on the pitch. I think quite a few of us got some some right hooks thrown at us from the Carlisle fans and it, it was just mental for about an hour and a half. We couldn't leave the dressing room. The, the dressing room windows were put in. It was it was just a crazy scene. Um, but, yeah, one of those things that I'm back on, you think, what an event, what a game to be involved in. God, brilliant. Yeah, it was crazy. And it, it got even weirder after that, I suppose, on your loan spells. Because on the final loan spell, you, went, you end up in Scunthorpe. I think it's just before, you obviously, uh, uh, you went to Hereford. But well, another thing I read about today is just incredible. You 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 initially joined them right on a one one month loan deal. Played played three games, scored in your debut. But uh, as it come to an end, I think Brian. Obviously, we mentioned it. I mentioned it to you before. I did run it past you. <laughs> Brian Laws is obviously in charge then. And it, this is just this thing that's on the internet that says Steve Guinan, Brian Laws took his tracksuit off him in the car park because he refused to sign on for another month. Is, is that true? And what, what was that all about? It is true. Yeah. Um, Brian was obviously a previous player for Forest. And, um, I knew a number of the Scunthorpe players because a couple of them were, were former Forest players. I think you've got Justin Walker, who's now a coach at Derby, Gary Bull, Lee Marshall. Uh, I, I knew I, I'd had a conversation with Brian a few times before I signed. Um, went on loan for a month to get some much needed game time because, again, I was on the fringes of the first team, but not really getting a sniff. And sometimes wasn't allowed to play in the reserves. And I think they had four games in the calendar month. I think my debut was against Bristol City. And I think I scored. I think we won. Or we might have drawn. I can't remember. Or we may have lost. I can't even remember. Um, played the next game. Uh, God knows how we got on. And then I think there was a game away at Burnley and it was live on TV and Brian pulled me and he said, I'm not playing you in this. I'm changing the system formation. And I was like, well, you made me these assurances that I'd play every game. I've scored one in two games. I think you're being a bit harsh. And anyway, I'm sticking with my decision. OK, fine. And then whatever it was, a week or two later, I wanted to sign for another month. And I was like, well, what's the point? I said I could have stayed at Forest and played four or five games in the 23s or reserves. And I've come up here to get games and you've left me out a couple of times. And I, I actually think I've done pretty well and scored a goal. So I'm not going to stay. And it was one of those where I think it was, I don't know, I've never spoken to Brian about it since. I've seen him a few times, but only pleasantries. It was like, right, and I was dressed in the tracksuit. Right, that's it. I want the tracksuit back then. And I was like, oh, well, I've literally got nothing on. Just, just my boxes. And he went, well, I want it back. It's called property, and I just thought, right, well, <laughs> that petty, you can have it. So oh, I just got up in the car park and gave it him, and um, yeah. So that that is a true story. Yeah, absolutely. So I went out in <laughs> pants. <laughs> brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Talking about pants, somewhere you wasn't. We're going to get on to Chapman in just two seconds, but um, you obviously joined Chapman from Hereford, and you were pretty prolific. It's fair to say at Hereford. What was it that? when you got to Hereford, that just clicked and you found your goal-scoring form. And then, obviously, you found all your goal-scoring form. I think it was two, was it two seasons? I think you were there. Yeah. Um, and then, obviously, the second season, the disappointment of, obviously, lose, losing out to Chester by a point and then going, losing the playoffs. Um, what was it What was it like? What was it about Hereford that just made you click at that point in your career? Um, do you know what? I, I think Graham Turner was a big influence. Uh you know, talk about coaches and managers, and he, he's, he's a mentor now for the League Managers Association, a bit like what John Ward does to, to Michael and Grant. Um, he didn't complicate the game for me. He just made it really simple. Um, that's the stuff I've been talking about today. It's about, you know, coaches and managers have all this information, particularly with data and stats and 
performance analysis and SNC and distance covered. But how much information can the players take on and utilize? I, I don't know. Graham didn't overcomplicate it. Listen, you're good at that. You're not so good at that. So stick at what you're good at. And and, and that was quite simple. And that, that seemed to resonate and hit home with me. Uh, I think the other thing really was probably, uh, as you've mentioned, rightfully so, I, I was pretty much a nomad. I had really played a large number of games at one club for ever. So even though I probably had longevity in the game and had various loan spells and been at Forest for a number of years but didn't play that many times, I, I probably knew the game. But I ha actually hadn't made that very many first team appearances for a football club for a season. And I think the first season I went there took me a bit of time just to get used to the level because I've never been in the conference before that. Um, Hereford is a bit of a place out on its own anyway. It took me a bit of time to get used to that. And I think I think in the first season, I think I scored 15, which a decent return, but wasn't brilliant. And I think I just found my feet. But then the second season, it was like, you know, with anything, that the more you practice, the better you get used to people and things and the ground and the fans. And that that second season, probably something similar to what we mentioned with Michael. So some shrewd signings. We played together for a season, got that experience. And we were, I was probably one of the oldest. We were one or two of the others. But again, there's some really inexperienced players in there. I think you've got a good, good blend of youth and experience. And, we just need to to hit it off the whole team and uh and you know when things go well and it it just i think it scored in the first game of the season confidence then I, I just thought right i'm gonna score every game i'm gonna play i obviously didn't but yeah that was my best return ever in a season yeah yeah it really was so towards the end then obviously you you end up leaving hereford on a free to come to Cheltenham, and i'm sure you know at that point you've you've had a fair run and you've had a, a good opportunity to sh to show what you could do. Was that was was it? Uh, what was it about Cheltenham that attracted you at that point? Um, I think Finney's mentioned this, hasn't it? I'd had a number of conversations with with Finney down probably from Christmas time onwards. I think John was looking for a, a different type of centre forward and. I was obviously scoring goals and he went, I think he likes you, he's had you watched. Would you be interested? As always is the case in football, you know, the Chinese whispers and players tapping each other up and former teammates. And um, at that point, obviously I was like, well, well, yeah, I would be, but I obviously want to wait and see the way things pan out in Hereford because without being disrespectful to Hereford, if we went up, I'd have probably stayed at Hereford. Uh, so I don't want to say yes, but I don't want to say no. It depends how it goes. Um, I, I, I knew obviously from Cheltenham not being a sorry with Cheltenham not being a million miles away from where I lived about the club. Um, I, I knew that I could handle the, the football league anyway because I'd spent most of my career there, and I think it helped obviously having a, a relationship with with John and knowing one or two of two of two of the other players. So, um, but when things didn't work out in the playoffs, it was like I'd had another couple of other clubs interested, but. Again, it's, you know, we've, we've lived in Plymouth. I've been on loan at Darlington. I've been on loan everywhere. It was like, at that age now, I need to make a, I need to make a base. I need to make a home. Midlands lad, Birmingham, right? Cheltenham's going to be the club for me. And I think what sealed it really was I met John Ward at a hotel in, in Warsaw. And we just clicked. And what was an hour's meeting turned into a three-hour chat. It was like, Christ, I want to play for this manager as well. So uh, it just, you know, tipped the scales in Cheltenham's favour, really. Yeah, definitely. I mean, me and JP have mentioned it so many times. What what a bloke John Ward is. I mean, as a manager, he was fantastic. As a bloke, I've honestly never met a man like it. Just so welcome in, talk to you for hours and hours. And it's like you said there, with the, with the little brief meeting that was well supposed to be brief, turned into three hours. I can well imagine that. And uh, what impact did he have on you before? I was going to well, what I want to ask you actually before that. He signed you alongside obviously Ashley Vincent. Brian Wilson, JJ Melligan, Gavin Keynes, Michael Townsend. You put all that together. What were your initial thoughts when you'd signed for the club and had those guys around you? What was it? What was it actually like? What were you, the day you walked into and into the club and what, what what do you think of the club? Well, I, I still say this now. I think I think the training ground is a fantastic place. I think it's you know 
way better than a League Two club, hopefully, obviously now a League One club. And I think that's a big selling point and an asset in terms of the base and the, and the facilities it's got. It was, you know, and it, it, again, it's commonly said, it was just a really good dynamic. The click, the players, everyone seemed to gel. And I think that's that's a huge part of it. You get players who want to fight for each other, who want to learn off each other, who respect each other. And, you know, like any other dressing room, of course, there's fallouts across the course of the season and players get disgruntled. And I can remember a lad called Michael Taylor. Remember him, John? Uh, I think yeah, him and, off, yeah. Yeah, him and, him and Grant actually flew across the change room at it in one game. And there, there was always moments like that, but it was with the best interest of team performance, really, at the heart. And there's always, you know, you look at Man United, in their years and Roy Keane Christ I would like to have been a fly on the wall there where but but players want it because you want to succeed and be a success so much then the passion does boil over at times yeah pretty much on a Monday or a Tuesday it's forgotten about um and, and again you know Keith and John very shrewd in terms of the blend of experience and youth so you've got Jerry Gill hadn't you you've got Shane uh Jamie Victory Shane Higgs Grant Coyote Spence you've got a real blend of fill into the spectrum but everyone yeah i look back so fondly on those training days now and again i, I you know some of the lads at chapel now and the first team players don't realize how good it is don't realize how good their moments are because it's just every day too it's a norm but i look back and i think what a group of lads what a group of staff unbelievable times yeah it was it was do you remember your first goal for the club no can't tell jp, it. JP? This is you oval, you at home, was it? You oval at home. I don't know. You beat me there, John. I had no idea. <laughs> pretty, sure, pretty sure it was oval at home in a one all. Is that right, it Tom? Draw. Oh. It was a draw, yeah. One all, you oval. Yeah. Oh. It was one all, you I couldn't tell you what it was, what it was a goal. Probably a trademark, uh, trademark Steve, Steve Ryan goal. But uh, yeah, I'm, oh, I'm sure. cross shot. Yeah, cross shot. <laughs> uh, wow, well, we'll get there. We'll get there. I love that. Oh yeah, we will get there very, very soon. But then, obviously, you've had your first, you have your first season. Team finishes fourteenth. As you mentioned, there's some serious characters in there, so I can imagine that that court kind of bought, built a little bit of confidence. And obviously, Wardy then went on let Martin Devaney go. I don't think he let him go. We at the time we had to let him go because of the money that we uh, we got for him. But obviously then Gilly Gilly had obviously been on loan. Then he Gilly signs permanently, and Gilly actually. Mentioned something the other week to me. I want to get your thoughts on it. He said, uh, I asked him what it was like as you, as your strikers. You know, he said every club's got their set of strikers. I said, what was it like to be in a part of that and battling each other? He said, you all got on. And he said, he, said, he spoke very highly of you. And he said, sometimes you don't get the credit you deserve for what you did. Do you, do you ever feel like that? Did you, is that something you ever crossed your mind? Because obviously you got Kay bang the goals in that season. He, I think he was just so prolific. Spence making the impact off the bench. Gilly coming in from from Bristol City, obviously adding the extra spice into it. He scored. He made a right good impression when he first came in. So, what was it there? Was it a bit like what was your feeling then? Did you think you got the credit you deserved? Um, well, let me just tell you, I had to send Gilly up a fifty pound note that Brian <laughs> Cook gave me. To... <laughs> um, you know what? Pro probably a feeling of both. I think. I think there's a lot of players nowadays who, who don't get the credit they sometimes deserve and perhaps float on the peripheries, which, which when you're a player in that dressing room and you know the good work that they do, it's not unseen by the players and the manager and the staff. And I think that's the most important thing. I think, I think for me, and I say this all the time, um, some of the, the biggest pat on the back and, and probably the best I ever felt was when I got picked for the game the following week because I knew then that I must have done something right. So if it was John chucking me a bib to say, you know, when he's naming the team, you're in, I felt a million dollars because I knew I must have done something right. And I think sometimes, you know, players aren't stupid the way they talk about filling in, doing this role. You've got to do this because it means so much to the team. And I think some of those players sometimes go unrecognised by the fans. And I'm not saying I did go unrecognised by the fans, by the way, but... I think sometimes I probably had to do some things I didn't want to do. Um, where I definitely at times had to play a bit deeper. To and again, I didn't have a problem with that because my lad who talks about the chemistry on FIFA, you know, when it all lights up, the chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> but 
the most important thing is the team result at five o'clock. So if it means that I have to play a different way, then so be it. Um, and I was quite often and I used to come back and I was so frustrated where whether it was Brian Wilson or Gilly or Kay or or JJ, where I'd perhaps link the play a little bit deeper. And by the time the whippets went past me, I was never in a position to get in the box. A, because I was the slowest player on earth, as I previously mentioned. <laughs> B, because I was so deep. But I look back and did we get a result? Did we yeah. score? And I mean, the communal, we did the team score. Did I play my part in that? And more importantly, if I got picked the following week, I'd take that. I'd take that on the chin. I'd just, that's one of those things. And um, uh, there's always a place in the game for that. And there's a number of those players. And the, one, of the, one, of the, one of the ones that I can remember back at Forest was a, was a player called Scott Gemmell. Now, Scott Gemmell was an unbelievable player, played for Scotland. But the Forest fans weren't particularly having him. But played probably two or three, I don't know, two or three hundred games, played in cup finals. But was one of those players that he was probably one of the first names you'd want to see on the team sheet. But from a fan's perspective, probably very harshly got, well, he's only in the side because he's Archie Gemmels. And I don't know, Archie was a coach at first. And it was totally wrong. He was one of the best players I've ever played with, but didn't yeah. get the recognition he deserved. So I probably had a feeling of both, in all honesty, but it's, it's irrelevant to me. And pr- perhaps, perhaps annoyed me a little bit more at the time, but, but now, yeah, it's one of those things you just do for the team. Yeah, definitely. Can I just say, um, it's quite interesting, that season you got promoted, you got 10 in all competitions. Obviously, two of them came in the playoffs. And me and Tom have spoken about this before. It's a bit like that this season for Chad. Nobody's nobody's in the 20s or 30s. And it was like that that season. Was it you and Kay both got, I think, 10 or 11 each? Um, Stephen Gillespie, Damien Spencer chipped in. But it, it was an all-round effort, wasn't it? It wasn't, any, wasn't reliant on one prolific goal scorer like Cheltenham have in the past with Danny Wright and Dan Holman when they won the National League. They both got, you know, they were both scoring every game much more of an all-round effort. And for Cheltenham to potentially win the league this season, nobody's got more yeah. than eight, which is amazing, right. really, isn't it? Yeah, that, so, is that right? Eight, then? Yeah, Andy Williams and Alfie May yeah. have got eight um, in the league. So, obviously, yeah. you scored the you scored the, the big goals when it mattered, but it yeah. was not uh, It was an all-round effort, team effort, wasn't it, that season, rather than one person out yeah. and we're going to struggle? I, I think you'd... Yeah, I think any coach or manager would, would want a main goal scorer, but, but you're right in terms of, well, if that player dries up or he gets injured, you, you want the goals to be shared because you can always get them from other sources. So, um, oh, that's an interesting stat, John. I'm, I'm glad you're on this call because I didn't know that. That's that's <laughs> fascinating. But yeah, well, all round team effort. And that's where you think it genuinely yeah. was. No yeah. one gave two hoots who scored the goal. It was it didn't, it didn't, it didn't get the result. Are we still making mention to, to, to the outcome that we want, which was promotion, and, and we were so. Yeah, it is. And then talk about that. What was the obviously. Craig Arm Spuggy joined the, the team that season as well, didn't he? Uh, in in the summer, he was the only signing, yeah, the only permanent uh, well, signing in the summer, yeah. Was it him and Mickey Bell? Mickey Bell joined. Did he join? Yeah. Yeah, I think Mickey Bell came a little bit later on, didn't he? A bit later, um, was he? From yeah. Port Vale, yeah. But, he, but yeah, he... Spuggy was one of the main ones, wasn't he? Because De- Devs went and then Spuggy came in. What was it like seeing him back up with him? Obviously, the three amigos, as I call you, back together again. Well, me, me, me and Finney actually tried to put John off from signing him because we didn't want him. <laughs> <laughs> we kept on saying, no, don't do it. Um, <laughs> no, yes. Yeah. We, we we knew what a good player Craig was, you know, and uh, versatile, could play in a number of different positions, championship experience uh, for a number of years. We, we knew he'd be a good addition. And again, it's, it, you know, for us two in particular, it was like, Christ, we're getting one of our friends to play with him. I think that added a little bit more to the melting pot because not only have you got, you know, the club, the fans, your teammates, so you don't, you don't want to let down. For us three in particular, we've been friends since we've been 14 years old and been on a number of holidays and been best mans at each other's wedding. It's like you've actually got two of your best mates on the pitch, so you better not let them down either. So it actually added a little bit more impetus and, uh, and desire to it all, really. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. And obviously, the season went really well as well. It, it's just, like I said, it was one of them seasons. It was just, I just lived forever in my in my memory. But let's let's go. Obviously, the season was a bit up and down here, there, and everywhere. But eventually, finished. We finished in the playoffs. We pretty solid in the end. Um, going into the first, let's say the first playoffs uh, playoff first leg. Then, and funny enough, John sent me a picture when I spoke to him. I think it was yesterday. He sent me a quite to Steve as well. Yeah, he sent it to you as well. I, I almost thought, who's that? And then I looked, I looked at the hair and I was like, yeah, 
That's don't know what the mullet was about back then. I've no idea. Yeah. Very it, wasn't part of the thing. it wasn't a bet, no. You, you and Gilly didn't <laughs> have any money on that. <laughs> no. you, you seemed to have money on a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, not great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Obviously, going into that, what was, what was the feeling going into that game? Because like John said earlier, it's with the playoffs, it's you've got one shot at it. You haven't got the, you know, the, the, when you get automatic, you're there, no matter what. Whether you've got two games, 10 games, well, not 10, but like three or four games then, say. But with this, you've got those couple of games in the semi-final. I mean, obviously, if you get there, you've got the final. What was it like, build-up going into that game? Um, I think that I think the build-up to the game, we... We were probably underdogs, John, if I remember rightly. I think Wickham were probably favourites, you know, to, to win the two-legged affair. And uh, well, we beat, we beat them two-one actually at home. Obviously, Keynesy and Gilly scored, and then we drew nil-nil at their place in the season. Yeah, uh, and, you know, you look at some of the players that they had in terms of Rob Lee, Kevin Betsy, Roger Johnson, Tommy Mooney. They they had some probably more higher-profile names than what we did, and I think. We, we were probably deemed as underdogs, whether that's right or not, I don't know. I think that was the, the feeling that we had as the players. But I think we also had a sentiment that we knew we could go there and get the job done. But I don't think really the reality is, I don't think any, I don't even think we thought we would go there and, and beat them 2 one. I think we knew we could grind out a nil nil or get a draw, uh, maybe even nick one. But to come away, you know, 2 1, I think was probably past our expectations to be honest with you i can remember the bloody stupid clackers can you remember them <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i can remember that and, did you uh, not like them as a player oh i couldn't stand them no because you only that's all you could hear just echoing and i'd rather fans give you abuse and uh, yeah I, just, <laughs> I couldn't stand them that's all you could hear just all around the ground and, and obviously i did the incident with rob lee which i still look back on on a yeah I, you know, I've said a number of times that I never meant it, but I genuinely thought I was walking because the, the, the referee at the time said, if I've got this wrong, I apologise. And just that look of horror, I thought it was going to be a red, but thankfully it was a yellow. And yeah, I think it was just such a professional performance from us. And, and obviously, you know, grinding out the, the second leg, the nil-nil, which would have probably been the, the reversal of what we expected the two legs to be. But yeah, uh, yeah just knew that we all could do it and we had belief in each other. But whether other people thought we could or not, I'm not really sure. Yeah, and you scored, of course, scored the second, uh, 2 0 up. And then obviously, Tommy Mooney scored late on. But after the game, what was the feeling? Because obviously, you said going there, trying to grind it out. Was was there maybe as underdogs? Was there a proper belief in there? What was Wardy's message to you after that? Um, didn't change. You know what to expect. They'll come to our place with the same game. You're going to have to defend for large periods of the game, but but we can catch them on the counter attack with some pace and playing the way we did. And uh, yeah, I, I can remember even in, in the second leg, I, I've watched it back obviously since and a number of times. And I actually think we did better than what I thought. I think my my thoughts at the time were, Christ, how are we getting away with this? Because I can remember things flashing across the penalty box. And I don't actually think they had too many clear cut chances at all. I don't think they created too many guilt edge chances that I look back on and think they could have scored. So uh, I think we. We probably live by the seat of our pants a little bit, but if I was Wickham, I'd probably come. I'd have probably come off thinking we haven't really created anything. We've probably dominated possession, but I haven't really done anything with the ball. So a lot of credits obviously got to go to the to the team and particularly the, the back five at that, that point. Yeah, how how pivotal was that back five in terms of making that nil that nil nil? Because like you said, they did have chances, but they didn't create a lot. But that back five, it, it uh, at times it was a bit touch and go. I mean, it was it was nerve nerve wracking stuff, even a nil nil. Yeah, yeah, I think it was. And well, you, know, you look at the goalkeeper and the back four, and mixture of experience and youth in there. But it, it, you know, the best teams in the world are going to are going to give away opportunities at the time, and you've just got to hope that when they do, your goalkeeper or the back four are going to dig you out. And you know that. You, Man City PSG game the other night, some of the blocks that Man City did and with all the plaudits they get for their attacking play, you've still got to defend with your lives in moments and spells in the game. And I think, you know, to a man, Jerry, Spuggy, Shane, you know, they, they were big, didn't they? So I look back on that. Fair play to them. Brave, brave as lines, really. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So the whistle goes, the place, Wadden Rose goes absolutely crazy. 
What was it like for you as the players in that moment? What was that moment as soon as that final whistle went and you knew that you were one step away from League One football? Um, mixed emotions, really. I mean, elation, obviously, you know, not, not being stupid, great. We're at the playoff final. And for me, it was like, ooh, Millennium Stadium, brilliant. Can't wait to go and play there. How when he's going to be there was irrelevant. Uh, and then I think the, 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 the passion and the, the almost it's actually over pretty quickly I think within five or ten minutes and you enjoy the moment with the teammates with the fans it's very quickly it's Christ we've actually got a massive game to play and it's all right it's in ten days time but the focus is going to turn and overnight really onto right well who we're going to face how we're going to prepare for that ten days is probably too long because you don't want to think about it too much uh, and, and I, I think I said to you John didn't I on the last thing we did together you know John and Keith and the club were brilliant in terms of getting yeah. getting going to the Millennium Stadium ahead of the game because it did take away that fan element. Yeah. Of, you know, we went down, I think, on the Wednesday and we, we went on the pitch and went up the stand and we took pictures. And I think that was huge because I look back and we wouldn't have been overruled, but when I still wanted to take photos, well, actually, I can't do that because I've got a game to play in an hour and a half. I think that was a massive milestone in doing that. And I think Grim Grimsby definitely didn't. That was some of the feedback that I got post the game, and I think they missed a trick doing that. All right, it was a massive distance, but that, yeah, they should have done something to meet them halfway. Uh, but very, very quickly, the 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 elation turned to focus. Really, in all honesty, with you, right? Let's not just end it here. Be a nice occasion, but don't end up crying on the pitch because your family's wives, girlfriends, everyone's going to be there. You've got to finish as winners, so that you know the the focus was pretty quick. Yeah, and obviously we had, like I said, I spoke to Gilly about it, about the final. Obviously, you started up top with with Gilly. What was it like, the game for you? Obviously, it was a bit of a nervy start. Yeah. You know, the game as a whole, it felt like Gilly said that we didn't really. We went to Grimsby earlier in the season, didn't really come away with much. So John was, you know, he was aware of that. So we went with you and you and Gilly. Obviously, Kay at the time was the top scorer. And according to Gilly, he had 20 tickets of all his family in the stands and stuff like that. And he didn't even start, bless him. But, uh, you know, what was it like? And obviously when Wardy said, right, you're starting. And then obviously, what was it like the first first 30, 20 minutes of the game initially? Um, well, AM, we, we were all annoyed at the state of the pitch. Because it, it was after, did they have rugby the day before, weekend before, I don't know, in the rain. And the pitch was horrendous. So as much as you dream about a playoff final, a cup final, the pitch was terrible. So And it was enormous. So we knew it was going to be energy sapping uh, because of the state of the pitch. It was just like squelching, to be honest. Um, and I think, again, probably, we knew, Christ, we're going to have to be every single player on it because if not, we're going to lose this. So everyone had to be at the races. Um, I think John and Keith did a brilliant job in terms of making sure the subs knew that they were valued and they were going to be as important as anyone a because of what i just mentioned about fitness and your legs feeling heavy but mm. you know picking up on what you said john it was a squad game it was a team game everyone was needed and i look back on that day and jj obviously missed who played a massive part k dealt with the fact he didn't start unbelievably well in typical k fashion yeah encouraging and praising teammates saying come on i look back at the picture of you know when the goal went in and I've got a picture of somewhere and Spence is jumping up, celebrating. And I bet that was a part of him that we thought, oh, I wish that would be. Everyone was in it together. And uh, you got Spuggy coming off with his, couldn't make him any uglier, but split his nose. <laughs> yeah, I was just about to mention that. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, you've got everyone who would would just do anything for each other, I think, genuinely. And I look back, there was a video clip, John. I don't know where it surfaced, where I think it shows John and Keith making the sandwiches or washing up in the bungalow. And, yeah, you know, that season it was just no one was bigger than the club. Everyone was willing to do anything for each other, and and I think in that game, all right, it was it was the last game of the season. But generally, the ethos and the spirit of that team was as good as I've known. And if people were coming off or dropped, all right, I'm disappointed, but more importantly, I've got to deal with that. And you're going to come on and you're going to win it. So fist pump, get on there, do your stuff. And that's what it was like. After we we knew it was bigger than. The eleven that started, it was everyone, everyone including the played a part across the whole yeah, season. Yeah. yeah, I think Damien played in in a part in all sixty one games that season. He didn't start that many, but he he certainly featured in all of them. And I remember when the team sheet came in, it wasn't a surprise that you were starting because you 
played in the semis and scored. And you, you but it was it was Stephen Gillespie was the surprise really. I think most yeah, people thought it would be you and Kay up front, but yeah. it, it worked, didn't it? Because both Kay and Damien both came on. Um, obviously, Mickey Bell came on and, and did a good job covering for Spuggy. Great player to bring on, experience wise, and, yeah. it, and it worked, didn't it? It worked, um, and it did get the result that was different to the two league meetings. So, John and Keith's plan worked, and the players delivered it. Yeah, yeah I, I think it goes back to the, the thing we mentioned before about strikers. I think managers want different types of combinations up front. You know, big man, small man, quick man, uh, target man. You know, if you've got a number of different uh, strategies you can use and deploy it up top because you know you could have whatever different centre backs, back threes, back fives, back fours, and at some point they're going to be able to get the better of your front. But if you offer them something different, there's always a way. You know, it's cat and mouse, isn't it? Well, we can do this, but we can do this, and if you do this, we'll do this. And John and Keith got it right on the day they did, and I can remember the conversation with with John and. You know, as much as I've played probably a large proportion of the games and scored and played in both playoffs, until he named me in the team, I was still like, well, I hope I'm playing here. I really do. And as much as I thought I probably would, you know, when he says those words, it, it, I remember him saying, listen, I'm going to go with Gilly because it's something different. You two seem to be, have different chemistry and on the same wavelength. Uh, and I think it would be better with, with Kane spending pace and strength. So... Uh, and they got it right. They got it right. Yeah, they really did. They really did. Um, John, before we get to it, is there anything you want to add with that one? Well, I just presume that we're going to talk about... the. We, we mentioned Spuggy getting injured. That was one of the key points in the game. But there was one yeah. other key point in the game that Steve was heavily involved in. I'm, I'm guessing we're going yeah. to have a chat yeah. about that. So I'll leave it I, to you to ask Steve about the, the big moment. Yeah, I can see on his face. He's, he, you know, he, he's so excited about this. He loves this conversation. <laughs> He really does. He loves it. So, well, again, let's talk about it. 60 minutes, an hour gone, nil-nil. It's been a bit of a slog, back and forth, obviously, cut the battle, battle injuries. The ball, on the 63rd minute, the ball comes to you on the far side. I think it's the right-hand side, isn't it? You cut in on the left, if I remember rightly. Now, the debate will go on forever, but I think Gilly hit it on the head when he says, does it really matter? But talk us through the goal, mate, from your perspective first. Um, I could, yeah, I can remember receiving it, and I think I tried to knock it past someone. I don't know why, because I can never do that anyway. And it, and it was sort of a ricochet and came back to me. And I can remember I was I was aware of where I was on the pitch and that Kay was on. And, and I can remember looking towards the far post and I saw Ash. And you know what it reminds me of? I nearly said it to someone last week, the Kevin De Bruyne goal. You know, when in the Champions League when he got the ball, and he and he just clipped it towards the far post and it went in and just evaded everyone. Yeah. And I, listen, I, I knew my limitations and I thought, right, it's heavy. I've just tried to beat someone I can't. Let's put it to someone now in an area that can probably cause some damage. I can remember seeing Kay, remember seeing Ash sort of set. And I thought, right, let's just try and drift one in towards the far post and see what happens. And that was it. No, and I think I think I made the comment straight after the game where I wasn't naive enough to claim that yeah I meant it no no way at all but it's it's one of those things where if it wasn't for for Kay and Ashley Vincent making those runs it's a crap cross the goalkeeper just picks it up and he, he just walks away and people look at me and go what were you doing but it's everyone in sync trying to make things happen trying to make probably the best of what was an average cross but to put the goalkeeper off is is He's concerned about then getting a little glance and it goes in, doesn't it? And then and then it's just chaos. And then I can remember Jerry pull, trying to pull my shirt and it's the worst picture ever because I've got to <laughs> here, haven't I? And, uh, but, but yeah, just huge. I, mean, I, look back, I still can't remember what I really felt or feel. It was just like, oh my God, it's gone in. You know, if it had been a 30-yard pile driver or penalty, but it was just like, how the hell has that happened? And all of a sudden you look around and it was the Cheltenham fans at that end and on that side it was like wow this is brilliant we won the look a for me personally but b more importantly we won the look in the 63rd minute we've only got half an hour ago to go come on yeah yeah was there not even a slightest little bit of you that thought let i'll put it in the box if it goes in it goes in there's not not even a slight little bit it was just a case of just find the guys because because of how heavy the pitch was and stuff like that i, I was aiming for the far post that was it. I just crossed the ball to the far post. That was all that was in my mind. Um, and it, it, yeah, that's exactly it. Aim towards the far post. 
actually pretty aimed pretty well if that was the case but yeah it's one of those things it just it went yeah. in and that's it but there was no it, you know no considerations whatsoever to shoot and on my left foot not a chance <laughs> 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 I did think it was a bit odd, but it's just to me like the debate went on forever. Was it a cross? Was it a shot? But the way you opened up your body when you took the ball on, onto your left foot, you opened up your body, and it was sort of like I could see that was it a shot because it does take the, the trajectory of the ball and the movement the way it goes. You could argue that, so I, I'll, I will say that cross or shot, it's one of them. It's uh, 50 50, I'd, I'd say, probably. If depends who you ask. If you ask one of the other lads, I'm sure they'll give you some stick about that. But you know, before we go there, obviously about five minutes later, Grant gets took down, gets a penalty, obviously misses it. Did you feel a, a shift in momentum then? Because Grimsby did go at it then, didn't they? To be fair to them, they come on, they did come on, come at us a fair bit. Um, was it? Did you feel like a bit of a shift in momentum, thinking, "Oh, right, we've got to switch on here now"? Did something click or? Um, yeah that was it was an uncomfortable moment because i I genuinely thought and i'd have never expected grant to miss that in a million years i thought if he puts that in that's it we're home and dry because even if they get one we'll we'll hang on but yeah definitely um live by the seat of a pants again a a little bit but to a degree i think we still look dangerous on the counter attack i think with spence and k i think we caused them problems but to do that you've got to absorb an enormous amount of pressure but it's not as if we hadn't done that across the course of the, of the season we've got experience of it uh more recently in the weekend game so we, we had done it but you know the closer you get to it i think the mentality is we're actually going to do this um and you still run the extra yard for anyone in the team and um yeah by hook or by crook we got over the line didn't we yeah, we did. It was tight. It was close. Um, obviously, Grimsby had the penalty shout, didn't they, as well, towards the end. Yeah. Or, on Mickey Bell. Was it a penalty? No. Behave. Get yourself up, mate. And go over. Yeah, nervous moments. Yeah, it was. It was really, really nervous. But obviously, then, final whistle goes, and it's absolute chaos. I mean, the scenes are just unreal to see. I, I, I always say it's unfortunate it wasn't Wembley. That's no disrespect to Millennium Stadium. It's just so unfortunate it wasn't Wembley, So I just feel that would have been just so special but it is what it is um but what was it like after the game for you guys i bet that with the, how close the squad was i bet it was absolute carnage isn't it uh i agree with you about the wembley bit i think it was such a shame it wasn't wembley but it's one of those things but yeah i think just do you know what you you work so hard for 10 months 11 months if you include the playoffs and for that I'd have hated to have been in the Grimsbury dressing room mm. because it worked so yeah. hard, built up relationships, and for it all to fall down on one game, as you said, John, it would have been soul destroying, and potentially probably one or two players may have gone, and that's always always in the back of your mind. And I think John was then being linked with roles and jobs as well, um, and it was just relief. It was like the game's over, we've done it. I can't walk, my legs are, are, are done, but then. You know, I can the team picture on the celebration. You pop the champagne, everyone's going mad. You get the adrenaline buzz again. The fans are starting to sing, and you, you get another ten or fifteen minutes in you. But the dressing room was was lively for thirty seconds. But I, I think it was just relief, honestly. Sitting down, I think we cracked open a couple of beers, and right, let's just make sense of what we've just done because this is an unbelievable achievement for the team and. Uh, for how long it's gone on 61 games was it John I didn't know that you know yeah wow that's it's an incredible amount of people and effort and time and energy has gone into that but yeah and then you start to think about next season god right league one and who's going to be in that league and yeah brilliant it was an epic season 61 games FA Cup run I think you got to the area semi-finals of the trophy but then it was a very short break wasn't it because of the late playoff game on the bank holiday at the end of May yeah. It was it was a really quick turnaround, and, and you you played a lot of games that season yourself. Ninety minutes in the final on a terrible pitch. Did you did you feel like you you got enough of a break before pre season that year? Because I know you'd never complained about coming back and playing football, but it was an unusually short break, wasn't it? Yeah, well, I, I actually had to go straight on the A license, John, as well for two weeks. I, for no I, holiday. <laughs> yeah, so I, it was at Lilyshaw at the time. So we had the open top bus tour, and then. 
the lads were talking about going away on holiday and I'm like, oh, I've got to literally drive straight up to Lillyshaw and go on the A licence for two weeks solid. Um, and I, I, you know, I didn't particularly want to, I wanted to just relax and switch off, but yeah, in hindsight, I look back and I think, well, actually, I, yeah, right, right move. But yeah, I definitely did, didn't feel as though we'd had a break at all. Um, and probably not that I was particularly old, but I think I probably needed a little bit longer, definitely. As probably at the time. Squad. Yeah, I think so. Um, so yeah, probably felt a little bit, I wouldn't say fatigued because you do come back, you've had a couple of weeks break, but definitely could have done with a little bit longer without a doubt. Yeah. And you wouldn't have seen it in the squad for the next season though, would you, to be honest? What was it like League One? What was the step up like? Was it, was it, was it like a bit of an eye, eye opener? Um, probably what we expected. And I think, you know, beating Swansea in that first game at the Liberty Stadium, the opening game was like, you know, we can hold our own here. And um, I think we probably knew what we what was going to be expected and we could hold our own, but I think we're under no illusions that we're also going to struggle for, for large periods because without being disparaging, it, it's Cheltenham and we, we were facing some much bigger clubs with bigger budgets, you know, in that league. Yeah, yeah, you, re you really was. And obviously that then was the, uh, I don't know where JP's gone. Just seems to have jumped out on us, but I'm sure he'll be back. I'm sure he'll be back. But yeah, obviously, then it's pretty much like the same it is now, actually. Just to touch on it quickly, with Chapman going up next year, the wage budget wise, I'm at 17th this year, budget wise. I mean, it is pretty much like that. So, what was the message from Wardy? What was it? What were they? What was him and Keith thinking going into that season? What was it? Just go and just go and do what you can do, and what will be will be because the season itself ended. It's probably, I think it's the still the highest finish league, Cheltenham league finish. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think you know John and Keith didn't make it look anything. It wasn't. It's like listen, we're going to have to face some uphill struggles this season. We, we're going to lose an awful lot of games, but we're also going to win some, and hopefully we'll win enough that will keep us up. That mm. that was it. you know when we get beat, let's not throw the towel in and get beat four, five, six. Let's stay in the game. You're going to have some great experiences of playing there at Swansea and. And a Forest Ring League, weren't they? And, yeah. Uh, and some of the big guns. And Leeds. I think, I think, Leeds, yeah. I think it's probably no dissimilar to, to the way, that, you know, that, that the team will face next season, really, when you look at, you know, who's coming down, potentially mm. Bill Wednesday, potentially Derby. You know, there's going to be some massive teams in that division. And why shouldn't Chapman compete with them? They should. It's 11 players on the pitch. And, all right, nine times out of ten, it's like the FA Cup. You expect the bigger team to come out on top, but there's always the occasion that they don't. And with planning, organisation, and prep, Chapman mm. will be in a good position as any. Probably, in all honesty, probably better in shape and position than what we were. Yeah, yeah. Talking of uh, FA Cup in 2006, great year. Obviously, we played Newcastle in the FA Cup. I mean, I may publicly known to me, Alan Shearer is one of my. He's probably my favourite ever player. Goal scorer wise, he's just an absolute legend. I mean, he could finish. Put the ball in the box, it's going in. Yeah. So you got the opportunity to play against him as well as ten other players. Um, Graham, Graham Sunis in charge at the time. What was that like? That that match, um, Newcastle coming to Wadham Road on on the B, I think it was on BBC as well, wasn't it? Yeah. How how was that? Brilliant. Honestly, it was it, yeah. Again, expected to lose. Then let's give him a game. Mm. And I think he did more than that. You know, I yeah. Think bit unfortunate with the goals. I think Chopra got the first, didn't he? Um, which was a bit unfortunate. But I think, again, we stood up man for man with him and huge admiration for the way that the, the back four dealt with Shearer and his compatriots. And I think we had our sniffs at the other end, in all honesty. You know, I think we'd, I had a deflection and uh, that I can remember. But again, this one, yeah, yeah, the K1, you look back on those moments and you think, Christ, I'm on the pitch with, Alan Shearer, which doesn't happen too many times, <laughs> you know, yeah. and you think you got to make the most of these occasions and it was brilliant. And i got to say, Newcastle were brilliant, you know, after the game, when he was dropping room, got some shirts, got some stuff signed. I think Dean Saunders was Graham's assistant who I played with the Forest, so he got me various bits and bobs. But yeah, brilliant occasion. And, you know, even when your career's over, you think you know, we played against Newcastle, which probably back then was an even bigger giant than what it is now, but with some absolute icons of the game in the team, no bigger than Shearer, like you say. Yeah, yeah, the absolute the man himself, absolute legend. Unfortunately, it came at the time where he was on his way out, really, but it is what it is. But I, I always make that game known as John Finnegan's best game in a Chatham shirt. I mean, how good was Finn as that day? 
Yeah. Uh, again, for me, probably didn't get the credit he deserved. And, and I know that Finney is so highly thought of and a Chatham Down legend, and rightfully so. But I think a lot yeah. of the good work, people just saw him running around and kicking people. And he was actually more than that, you know, yeah. in terms of leadership, his ability on the ball, he holds when he needed to without being prolific. He, he, he was such a good person in the game. I'm not quite sure if he'd have done it at any other club. Him and Cheltenham just seemed to click as a club and uh, as a fan base, the connection with the whole town. And uh, again, rightfully should go down in as one of Cheltenham's ever, best ever players. Lost Tom, Steve. But yeah. um, I'll, I'll ask you a question. Can um, I remember chatting to you in those in um, the season after, so six or seven, and you scored against Bristol City in the League Cup in a really good win, didn't you? And then, but I, I remember asking you in an interview, were you worried about the lack of goals? But I still think you were doing a, an unsung job for the team at the time, probably more so in League One than you have been in League Two. But when when did you start to think that you might, you know, need to look elsewhere? Because you you went back to Hereford that season, didn't you, on loan? Um, yeah. So when did you start to think it might be time for? Because he John didn't make changes again, really, did he? Uh, again, going into that season, it was very much the same squad. But when was it you thought yeah. you might need to move on? Um, I can't remember the exact moment, but I think, in all honesty, I probably knew it pretty quickly after the playoff final, um, because of the fact my contract was up. I was trying to negotiate a new deal. John wasn't budging on what he was offering, and. I thought, well, actually, I think I've done a decent job for the side. By no means the star player, but I know I, my self-belief was that I knew I could do it at League One level. John may have thought differently at that time. Um, and I knew probably pretty early on that, actually, if I don't score a number of goals early on, he's going to be looking elsewhere because you need someone that can score in, in, in League One. So I thought the goal at Bristol City was sort of mid mid to end August. I don't know. It was in August. I yeah. definitely remember. And I thought, okay, that will bide me some time. But I, I think probably, and I've never had that conversation with John. I think he was probably already looking elsewhere. So I probably already knew, really, in my own head, that I was a squad player at best. So I probably knew my days were numbered. In all honesty, with you. yeah. And Paul Connor came in in the January, and really, he he was similar. He, he didn't score a lot of goals in League One, but he did work hard and and set up chances and, and link play so i think again he didn't he didn't come in and suddenly score 20 because he had a decent scoring record before he came in but i think yeah. it was a lot of a lot of it was back to the wall wasn't it in that season playing against teams like forest and then yeah you know. yeah i think you look at any relegation team or teams near the bottom they don't have people who score in 25 30 do you no. unless you got an anomaly you know you're looking at double figures 15 at best so uh i think any striker probably going to struggle to be honest with you yeah are there, are there any particular games that stand out apart from the, the bristol city game because even though you didn't you weren't banging the goals in you you, you caused some some good upsets didn't you upset a few of the bigger clubs in the division uh, before you you moved on midway through no not really i just think it was again as much as i knew probably you know that's it the writing's on the wall it was well, actually, I've still got a lot of friends here who want to be a success. So probably tinged with a bit of both, really. It was like, well, I really didn't want to go. Knew I had to for my own career. But that was definitely that, that thought process of, well, I don't really wish anyone any harm because my mates are still playing. I wanted to see him do well. And I still like the club. So it was like, well, OK, be professional about it. Uh, shake hands and move on. That was it. So no, no real standouts for me, really. Probably the Swansea game was the first one when we turned them over. Yeah. And you hit the ground running back at Hereford, didn't you? Straight away, I think, first game back, like you'd never left the goal. I think you scored two on your first game yeah. of your second spell. And, you, and then you, you, you again, you, in League One, you did it for Hereford, didn't you, as well, when they got they went up? Yeah, you know, just again, everything seemed to click soon as I went back. Notts County, that was. Uh, and, and scored some goals. And I think the season we got relegated with Hereford in League One, again, it was a struggle, but I got 15. And I think my first goal was Bristol Rovers away. And I think we got beat 6 0. But actually, what, what you didn't see, I, there was a fist pump. And I think we were six, I think we were five or six nil down. And I scored the goal in like the 90th minute, a nothing goal. And it was a scramble. I probably towed it in from about three centimetres. But the relief for myself was well, I, I can score in League One. Uh, and then I actually think I had a decent season in a 
difficult to pull side. But um, yeah. yeah, it was one of those where probably a little bit more experience, but but knew my strengths, limitations, yeah. and the team. Yeah, we found a way to get some results, but you know, unfortunately, it wasn't enough. Yeah, fifteen in a, you know, because Cheltenham had a terrible season that year under uh, Martin Allen, really, where a lot of good work that John Ward and Keith Downing had done. No swearing, please. Ways, but but uh, sorry, yeah. but uh, yeah, I think to get fifteen in it, you know, for Hereford to be in League One, then Cheltenham to be in League One is is always a decent achievement. So to get fifteen must have given you a little bit of satisfaction that you knew you could do it at that level. Yeah, it did. It did. Um, yeah, massively. And I, I look back and yeah, again, Leeds in that. We beat Leeds uh, home. I think we beat them away. Uh, Leicester, we, we, we gave them a game away, and again some huge teams. And I think in any in a, in any sort of fan base and club, you've got to realise what success is. And I think you're right for for Hereford and Cheltenham to be in League One. That is success. Whether you're clinging on to the last game of the season, that is success. But you know, the longer you can stay there, rightfully so, you have got aspirations to try and do a little bit better. And uh, every year. Yeah, just a random one that I wanted to ask Steve about. You, you mentioned being on the same pitch as Shearer and, and Stuart Pearce and people like that, but I think, am I right in thinking early in your time at Forest, you played against the famous Arsenal back four at Highbury? I did. Oh, did what was that like? As well, JP. <laughs> of, all, of all the defensive lines to have to come up against as a young lad at Forest, what was that like against those four? Uh, I think Keogh at the time. Keogh, not Adams, uh, Winterburn and Dixon. Yeah. Would Seaman yeah. have been in goal then as well? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Piera played, Bergkamp was up front. Uh, yeah, again, one of those hairs, up, you know, standing up on the back in it. It was Dave Bassett was in charge, came on, and it was like, I'm actually on the pitch with these legends again. It was one of, but I can't think about that because we've got a game to try and get a result from. Uh, but yeah, Tony Adams just never shut up. That's the only thing. Sorry, the biggest thing I can remember constantly organising. Martin, come here, chuck in, you go there, D David, push up. It was just, he never stopped talking for any moment. Um, yeah, un un unbelievable sort of leadership and captain skills from, from the short period of time I was on that pitch, but great experience. And, and the, the pitch, everyone talks about it being a carpet. It was better than a carpet. Absolutely oh, unbelievable. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Well, as you Hello. mentioned there, sorry, JP. That's right, Tom. No, go on. All right. I was just saying, you mentioned there that like one of my favourite midfielders, Patrick Vieira, played in that game. What was he like as well? Did you just think, right, avoid that man because, you know, the way he is and the way he played the game? Yeah, he's eight foot six. He'll eat me up and I don't want to get in a tackle with him, so I'll just avoid <laughs> it. Um, but sometimes you're just in admir you know, as much as you're on the same pitch, you are players, you know, they're brilliant, aren't they? Um, yeah, uh, just even with Burkamp, some of the touches that he did in that game, I can remember looking on from the other end of the pitch, 50 yards away, thinking, my God, what a player. To be up that close and see the way they perform the game and execute certain tricks and movements, brilliant. And that's where, you know, one of the things I said about really scrutinizing and analysing the game, to see it up close. And it's like, you know, you go as a fan, we have a pie, we have a pint now, and I do, but when you really studied the top players, it's phenomenal some of the detail and some of the positions that they get themselves in and how clever they are. It's it's fascinating. Yeah, it really is. It really is. I mean, it, before we finish, I don't know, JP, if you've got any one questions, I've got a question I just do want to finish on. Yeah, I've got one more, Steve. Um, you know, on your CV, people, a few people might not know that you were at Cambridge only really briefly. Obviously, they're yeah. one of the, the, the teams that, well, the only team that can stop Cheltenham winning the league. So, do you, I know you weren't there very long, but do, have you found it quite interesting that Cheltenham and Cambridge for a lot of the season have been going for the title, two of your old clubs? Yeah, and uh, Mark Bonner, the Cambridge manager, is actually on the pro licence at the moment. So I'm uh, doing some work with Mark. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's still it's still going to go to the wire, isn't it? But uh, I've got no sort of uh, allegiances to Cambridge far from it. So I'll, 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 I'll be possibly wearing a Cheltenham shirt at the weekend, but um i have huge admiration for mark and the way he's gone about it you know ahead of coaching working in development stepped up uh grasped the opportunity with both hands and i do think there's some brilliant coaches working in some of the younger age groups and development teams sometimes they just need an opportunity uh, and mark's one of those coaches that have took it with both hands so i hope that cambridge go up but obviously i hope that challenge do it as champions 
Yeah, definitely. Could have said it better myself. But then me and JP have said, haven't we, so many times, if Cambridge did win the title, you can't deny that they, they deserve it, really. It, it, uh, not in this position now, necessarily, but overall in the season, how good they've been. Yeah. If Morecambe go up as well, that would be, you know, we've spoken about Cheltenham and Hereford being in League One. If Morecambe get there, you know, with their budget, that would be one of the great footballing stories that like Accrington getting into League One, Wickham getting into the Championship. I think that would be unbelievable. Me too, me too. I know a couple of the guys at Morecambe, so I hope they do it as well. But uh, yeah, little little seaside is going up. Yeah. A brilliant story for them. Yeah, great. And Cheltenham wouldn't have the smallest budget in League One either, probably. So. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's it. All right, Steve, before we finish, um, just overall then, when you look back on your career, some of the highlights, the players you've played with, the managers you've been under, like what would your assessment be looking on your career? <laughs> Lower league journeyman. I played in every league, Premier League to conference. Um, I've been extremely lucky, you know, wanted to be a professional footballer like every kid out there, managed to do it. Had more clubs than Jack Nicholas to be able to do it. No, <laughs> no England, like the back of my hand. I don't need a sat nav. I know every single motorway to get everywhere because I've almost played there. Um, but I've, I've been lucky. I've, I've kicked a bag of wind around for 20 years and got paid to do it. Uh, I know how lucky I am and I look back on the game with so much affection and there's always highs and lows but I'm definitely a glass half full person so even with the lows I look back on it and think well it didn't break me did it you know what I mean it was a tough time but managed to bounce back so uh, loved my time as a footballer I mean would do anything to have it again tomorrow I really would yeah yeah definitely and from a Cheltenham perspective then I did it to Gilly I'll do it to you it's only fair I know what you'll be like. You didn't ask me, you didn't ask me, you put me on the spot. I'm going to do it. How, how, if you could sum up your Charlton career in one word, what would it be? Successful. Yeah, I, I mean, Love Love some it. people will deem success as different things, and I didn't score 25 goals a season. But for me, you know, I didn't really play a part in Forest promotion. I was. I, in the squad a lot of the time on the bench but that was my first real promotion and to play a big part in it and to score the cross shot that, that led you there that's success for me whether I scored one goal and that was the only goal or I scored 50 goals so I look back on the place with affection but yeah to sum it up successful because it was absolutely brilliant I think I agree what a way to finish um <clears throat> sorry my voice is going for some reason no idea why yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm not getting emotional cheers Steve <laughs> thank you Steve I love you Steve <laughs> <laughs> nah, Gilly, uh, guys, honestly, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for scoring one of the most important goals of my childhood. It, it was great. I was only a young lad then, hard to believe. Not making you feel older out, but yeah, honestly, thanks for joining us and thanks for, you know, everything you gave for the club. It's, uh, I think I speak on behalf of everybody and say, you know, gave it all. And uh, as Chatham fans, that's what we, me and JP always say. That's all we ask for, is to give it all. And it's probably the biggest thing that you've done for us is put us in a position again where we went into league league one we're going to do it I hope well we're going to do it again this year um but looking back you were a big part of that and i think it runs a lot in parallel with uh with with the history there we are now so cheers for coming yeah. on i really appreciate it can i just um, say steve great to yeah. see you doing so well with your career after football there was never in doubt that you, you do well after football because you're always working away in the background Good luck to Zach with his, you know, whether he stays in football or whatever else he does, but I'm sure he's got a bright future. And I know you're a coffee connoisseur now, Steve, so hopefully meet you for a coffee soon. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Nice to reminisce, guys. Really enjoyed it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Cheers, mate. And yeah, I echo that. Best of luck to you and the family and stuff. And yeah, stay in touch. It'd be great to keep in touch with you. JP, as always, it's been a pleasure. I really enjoyed that. Thanks that for inviting me uh, on. Brilliant. Brilliant. I really did enjoy that. It was uh, really good. Really good to catch up with you. Um, hopefully, we've got one. Well, we've got one more episode of this pod left next next week. Hopefully, we're talking about uh, the crowning, but I'm not going to go there too far. I'm not the baby sort of one. Before anybody puts me on Twitter with that one, the crowning. But yeah, thanks for joining me. Obviously, thanks to our sponsors, Luke 1977. Uh, always appreciate your support. Thanks for everybody that's listened, watched, shared, subscribe, and like the video. Drop your comments in below. And uh, yeah, until next time, guys. Come on, you Robins.